Corey. I'd just like to I'd just like to say um, welcome to today. Um, this webinar is, is um, called Sensitive Processing, Functional Implications for Practice. Uh, it's hosted by the Online Inclusion and the Services for Australian Rural and Remote Allied Health. What we'll do is if I'll just go through a couple of, of housekeeping things. We'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. I've never done one of these before, so um, putting hands up and things like that during the presentation is just probably going to confuse me a little bit too much, so I apologise. So we'll hopefully leave about 15, 10, 15 minutes towards the end to do the, the questions. Um, and what you do is you actually um, put the question in by raising your hand and then we'll actually hopefully be able to hear your question and then I can answer it. Um, hopefully it will all work out. So, um, oh, and just quickly actually, just um, we wanted to let you know that the recording link will be available on oi.org.au within 24 hours and a link will be emailed out to all of you as well. So, once again, thank you for coming along to um, taking the time out of your busy days and coming along. My name is Deborah Thomas. I'm a senior occupational therapist here in um, Perth at a practice called Wise Therapy. We're in the southern region of Perth. I graduated from Curtin University um, a long time ago <laughs> and was working with pediatrics, children and their families um, it's about 20 years ago. So that's where my passion started. My first sensory integration course was in America um, back way back when. Since then I've done numerous jobs in um, schools, private sector, um, public sector and I've worked overseas in the States and back here in Australia in Perth. Um, I've done various certifications and, and professional developments which all just kind of helped me really put piece all of these things together and I just want to say that none of it ever stops. Every time I go to another presentation I just can think and hear more things that would just help me explain this area to families just that little bit more. Um, I'm passionate about the sensory regulation, sensory processing area um, and also how it all kind of works together with families and the whole philosophy of family centred practice. In addition to that, I've got a family of my own, two busy boys, one of them very much a sensory speaker and probably one of them more a little bit on the low registration side, so trying to juggle all of my professional ideas and opinions and practices with my home life has been quite, a, quite a, um, a path, I guess you could say. So, all right, so just quickly, Wise Therapy is a multi-disc family centre practice in Borragoon in WA and we have OT, speech and physio and we also have just started um, about six months ago, we have a consulting psychologist as well who our families can look to, um, tap into. So we're based in the south of Perth, like I just said. We're base our philosophies on family and client centre practice. We provide choice for our families, maximising participation. We have the team approach to therapy, which we all find is essential when working with our families and their kids. We've got, we are guided by professional integrity and commitment and evidence-based services. So today, um, really what we're going to do is um, very, very briefly in a nutshell of one hour or less than talk about what is sensory processing and what the seven sensory systems are, the levels of arousal, how sensory modulation and self-regulation fits into all of that, what as an OT um, I would do in clinical practice and in function and then how that all fits into family centre practice. Um, and what I'd like to say just right up the front is basically my presentation is based on the various works by Winnie Dunn, the Will Baggers and the Sarah Brush Brushing Protocol, Patricia Otter and Sheila Frick and their Moore program, Chris Shaparo, Lisa Scott and Suzanne Wakefield, Jen Jerob, Mary Sue Williams and Sherry Schellenberger and the Alert program and Dr Stuart Shankar among many other articles and presentations that I've been to across the years. So um, all my, hopefully my references are current, the ones that I have at the back of my presentation, but I would, did want to just really um, refer to and acknowledge all of the work done by these amazing people in the field. So 
On to the presentation. What I would like you to do as we're going through the presentation is really that we have to kind of, you've probably already got in mind a, a, a number of kids um, that you are working with. And while we're going through the presentation, just think about what are the primary characteristics of those clients and those kids that you're working with and start to maybe even fit it in as we talk. So that way you, you can either guide your questions or it can actually start making sense as you go through. Um, and that will, that will help you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, could I just have a question from Bruce? Can everyone see the slide? I think that's what I meant to ask. Sorry about that. Just got a brief note passed to me. All right. So if you are having trouble seeing a slide, I don't know if maybe let me just see someone down here. So if everyone can see the presentation, if you can't. Um, I guess if you send a chat a uh, question through, put your hand up maybe. Um, okay, so far everyone can, I hope. All right. Great. So a sensory process uh, sensory processing, what is it? It's the ability for us to take this information from all of our senses and organise and interpret that information so that we can put it together with prior knowledge or with memories in our brain, information stored and knowledge um, stored in our brain, plans that we've made previously or even motor planning that we need to use and then make a meaningful response to that. And so that happens within nanoseconds. Our, our, our system takes in all the information and basically it process goes straight up into our body, straight up to the brain and then um, filters it and registers it and makes a meaningful response after planning what we need to do. It's an incredibly complex situation um, and a complex um, process as well. And given that we only have 45, 50 minutes and the, there is, I just can't go into all of the neuro, neuro um, plasticity and the neuro um, uh, processes to it. Um, so hopefully the presentation will be to the, the right level of everyone. When we have efficient sensory protein, uh, processing, what we're doing is we're able to modulate our levels of alertness, which means that we can actually be aroused for the type, for the situation that we need to be aroused in. We can be more relaxed for the environment that we need to be relaxed in. Um, and we can be more um, active and um, for the other environments that we need to be more active for. We also need to use accurate sensory processing to have an accurate picture of ourselves and the world around us, our own internal body schema. Um, this allows us to interact with the environment, interact with other people. So if we don't have the efficient sensory processing and we don't have an efficient, accurate presentation of, representation, sorry, of ourselves and how we are, then we're not going to be able to accurately interact with the people or the, or the environment around us. So once everything is working, we can then learn and participate effectively in everything that we need to participate in. And that might be home life, that might be day childcare, school, Nana's house, the community playgroup, anywhere that requires a level of, um, of learning and attention. So conversely, we will talk about a little bit about what we see if a child is not or a student that doesn't have accurate sensory processing. So we might see, and again, you've probably already got pictures of some of the students in, or sorry, I keep talking about students, but um, some of the little kiddos in your mind, of they've either got excessive or remarkably low energy or activity level. So they're not, their activity level and their arousal level doesn't match their environment that they need to be in. Frequently we see impulsiveness, uh, we see short attention span and flexibility, we see motor coordination difficulties and problems with muscle tone, which leads to difficulties with motor planning. We often see um, the inability to have to find a preferred hand, so there would, might be switching of hands during tool use and manipulation, poor eye hand coordination, so um, learning of phys ed or the playground, um, being able to, to use um, knife and fork, all of those things become a lot more difficult. A lot of the children that we see with difficulty in sensory processing um, are very resistive to things that, that they're not familiar with. 
and this is because it's out of their control suddenly. When when a system, when a when an environment or a task um, or an activity is familiar to them, it means that they can control it, and they they may be able to use what they've pre-learned on how to access that task. But if they're unfamiliar, and if they know that their body doesn't feel right, if they can't plan and organise what they're meant to do, then there's resistance to that. And so we might see that in terms of a behaviour that is an avoiding behaviour, we might see it as a withdrawal behaviour, we might see it as um, a distractible, I'm going to be the funny one here, or they might be whiny and um, you know really act out. So that leads us to difficulty making transitions from one activity or situation to another because they really do like to control everything. Okay. We see a lot with, um, with the children with, with sensory processing difficulties that they have a very low frustration tolerance and this leads a little bit back into the, the ability to, to not have control. Because once, once again, if, if they um, are needing to attack a situation or an activity that is not familiar to them and therefore they have to organise the information, organise the task, organise their bodies and then process all of that and then plan what is needed to be as an outcome, if they can't do all of that, then their first response is their frustration levels drop and so they don't have that ability to work through things. So um, they're the ones that really, they, they I can't, I can't, they get quite quite whiny, quite difficult and then they just, um, they just learn from that experience. They have difficulties with regulating, so not, like I said before, not able to match their arousal level and their regulation to the activity that is needed. So for example, um, at, um, at playgroup, it's great, you can go out and you can play, you can ride the trikes, you can um, play in the sand, you can dig, you can yell, but if it's time then to come inside and have a bit of fruit, then that, that um, self-regulation, that arousal level actually has to come down to be able to come inside to a smaller environment, sitting down, having some fruit and a drink with your, with your little mates, and if a lot of the children we see can't actually regulate that, they'll still be coming in very late, very quick um, and not able to calm themselves. So leading into that in some of our, our kindergarten and pre-primary kids in early intervention and then leading further on into, into um, the early primary to middle primary, we do see the academic difficulties because they're just not able to learn as effectively as um, other, other children. Definitely social skill behaviour problems we see a lot and emotional behaviour problems um, as well and those two kind of lead in a little bit together um, and that is based on all of their, their ability to self-regulate, their ability to plan and organise and filter activities as well. So we often see children that um, don't have that personal space because they can't, they can't have an idea of what their own body schema is, so therefore how do I know where that other person is in front of me? They might be a little bit rougher with people, they might be a little bit more in their face, um, and again, not being able to read all of those, those, those um, nuances of social language. And then of course we see a lot that there's um, irritation of daily activities as well. So when we break it down into the seven sensory systems, um, we're going to talk about each one in a little bit more detail, but the two main ones that we, that we I guess as OTs really focus, or well, not main ones, we do tend to put a lot of our emphasis through into the vestibular, the proprioceptive and the tactile. Obviously we're not forgetting the visual, auditory, oral and olfactory, but when we talk a lot about our sensory diets and the activities that we like families to focus on um, and to work towards as a, as a basis and as um, a ground, a, like a building block, we do look at the vestibular, the proprioceptive and the tactile a lot. So going first with the vestibular system, it's really what we see is the unifying system. It, the receptors are located in the inner ear and the vestibular system is, uh, is um, is perceives movement and speed. And so as soon as we move our head in relation to gravity, so sideways, upside down, we're actually stimulating the vestibular system. And this system is vital for muscle tone, for postural control, bilateral integration, 
ocular motor control and auditory processing. So without the vestibular system working to its maximum potential, we're going to potentially see difficulties in all of those different areas as well. Um, we need it for uh, attention and concentration and for a good level of arousal. So basically, the reason it's called the unifying system is because it coordinates movements of the eyes, the head and the body. So it basically is the, the coordination um, system, centre. The proprioceptive system is what we see as our internal eyes. So as we talked about before, it really gives us awareness of our own body schema and of our own body position. Um, it's stimulated by feedback from the receptors in the muscles and joints, and it's important for judgment of force, for, um, for attention and, and concentration, and really for your own body awareness. As I said before, without good proprioceptive processing, without good body awareness of oneself, we're actually got less ability to be able to perceive how we are in relation to the environment to other people. There has been research um, that the, the uh, who was it the Wilbag has brought up in terms of the fact that heavy work, which is the basis of proprioceptive processing, actually releases serotonin, which is the feel-good drug, and the deep pressure releases the dopamine, which is the relaxation drug. So when we're talking about the proprioceptive system as uh, really a key for arousal and attention, we can see that the neurochemistry behind proprioceptive input is, is really important and, and really strong. So another key one for OTs is the tactile system. And this refers to our sense of touch and the information that our body gets through our skin. And that includes the, the, the amount of in, the, the information that we get from the, the inside of our mouth as well. Again, you know, through the tactile system in, in conjunction with the proprioceptive system and the vestibular system, this actually helps us learn about our body and the environment. We receive information through light, touch, pain, temperature and pressure. And when we talk about all of those areas, it's important to actually take those into consideration when we talk about our families and what kinds of activities that they might include in their sensory diet, which we'll discuss further. But we might actually look at whether it's cold or hot temperature that we can include or what they're sensitive to or what they're seeking. What kind of pressure are they seeking? Um, you know, some kids we might, you know, really do love that, that tickly light touch, whereas some kids will be hypersensitive to that, in fact, most kids. But we do have to take into consideration the individual's preferences. We have the exploratory system and we have the defence system and we have to just, again, I can't go into a lot of detail about those two systems because that's a, probably a two or three day talk right there, but we do have to know the difference between those two and know how we're stimulating. Basically the defence system is the one that is triggered through um, the, the uh, tactile defensiveness. And that's the one is usually light touch, it's unexpected touch, and that can set a child into the fright, flight or fight response. It's a very important safety um, system though. Without the defence system, we won't know what danger is. And so a lot of the time we see with our children is that they actually are showing a reduced defence system and a reduced tolerance, uh, sorry, an increased tolerance to things like pain. So those are the kids that the parents say, well, they just have scratches all over their legs and always bumped his head really badly on the side of the coffee table, but he was really good, he didn't cry. Um, and we can see that those children are just not registering their um, tactile system enough and it's really putting at risk the defence system. Um, the light touch, which is the, uh, the defence system, is really telling us to, to pay attention. Um, and what we have to do is really differentiate, well, I guess, assessing our children is that light touch, like I said before, a uh, high tolerance or a low tolerance, or a high threshold or a low threshold. And the touch pressure is the one that we would use the most in our, in our work as OTs. And, um, is really the firm touch, the comforting touch. We really use that, just like I talked about before in terms of the release of the neurochemicals. This is the one that we use a lot to modulate the nervous system, to bring a feel-good um, 
feel good drug into the system and a relaxing drug into the system. So the visual system is, um, we need that so that we can interpret what we see and make a meaningful response. And I think a lot of the time we have to be very clear with families that it's not that um, we look at the visual system to see if the child can see or not, but how they're processing what they're seeing. Um, and this is really important to be able to take the information in through the visual system, analyse it, store it, and then respond to it. And the visual system includes coordination of the two eyes, the focusing, the eye movement control, and visual perceptual skills. And right from the get-go, little, little babies are already starting to do all of that visual processing with their hand-to-mouth, bottle-to-mouth, breath-to-mouth, um, and all of those things that little babies do is all starting to develop those visual maps. And that's how we learn about our body. And that's also how we learn to um, use our visual maps in future learning as well. And we do find that you don't we with children that have um, praxis difficulties or motor planning difficulties that by using visual maps and motor maps we're actually helping them to get a more of a, uh, a feel of what what their body and how their body is being and doing things. The auditory system um, is an, another another big one that we will work closely with our speech pathology uh, colleagues with, um, and it's really the process of hearing. Once again, it's not whether a child can hear or not, but how they're actually interpreting and processing speech and environmental sounds. Very closely linked to the vestibular system because the vestibular system is processed through the inner ear, and. Again, once again, we'll see children with difficulties with vestibular processing um, and will often have difficulty with the auditory processing as well. So being able to understand what is being said, but also being able to filter all of the different noises, being able to register what's important, what's not important with all of the different noises, and then being able to make an, an appropriate language response for that situation, whether it's a whisper in the eye of the movie cinema or a really loud yell to your friend who's on the other side of the playground who you want to come and um, call over. Just like we do with motor memories and tactile memories and visual memories, we also have sound memories. And we start to very, very early on, again, distinguish what an object is or who a person is by the sound alone. And we do find sometimes that children um, with sensory processing difficulties aren't able to use those sound memories well, just like the other memories. So their the, the working memory of what they're hearing and what that means um, just isn't processing properly. So they need a lot of repetition. And lastly, but definitely not least, it's the olfactory and the gustatory system. And so that's the, um, the smell and the taste, and they are obviously very closely related. Um, and it's basically being able to process smell and taste. And it's an ability that is amazing. We can really process and distinguish thousands of scents. Actually an incredibly powerful um, mode of sensory input. Um, you know, straight away we can we can use, and it, I'll just go back a little bit, and it travels again to the limbic system, which which is the system that governs the emotions, behaviours, and memory. So we straight away will come up against a smell, and it might be just the briefest smell of something, and automatically we may not want to taste that, we may not want to go to that environment because it's so strong in our memory system. And so a lot of the children that we see again um, with those those uh, picky eating or the fussy eating or the resistant eating may actually be linked to not necessarily what the taste is but what the smell is of, of the food um, because when they smelt it last it was just so, their, their threshold was so low that the smell was so pungent and so negative for them. Okay. 
So given that we have all of that information about the sensory systems and um, I hope that, that that information makes sense to you. I'm sure that most of the information is something that you've, you've um, processed before and heard about before and are using in your practice. What we do now is with sensory modulation is our ability to basically take all of that information that bombards us on a daily basis, on a minute by minute, second by second basis. We take that information in. We filter out what's relevant and irrelevant. We prioritise where our focus should actually go to. And then we make a slight change. It goes to our brain. We've organised it, filtered it, registered it. It goes to our brain and we plan. And we have to actually then have an outcome, a motor outcome, a, a, a behavioural outcome, an emotional outcome. But it has to be regulated. It has to be appropriate to the environment that we're actually in. And again, the sensory modulation side is, is a really big one for a lot of our children because on the surface we have a lot of our families that say, no, no, his body listens to me, no, he actually eats really well, but oh, he just cries all the time if I say something or uh, that I say something that is, or a plan has changed or he, um, if the TV isn't turned on at five o'clock, he gets really upset or he doesn't like to come in from outside or he doesn't really like to go outside. And those are the, those, that's the sensory modulation side. That's the ability to really regulate um, our, our arousal levels according to the situation, the environment. And when we look at the levels of arousal, um, you know, given all the work that's done by, by Winnie Dunn and Chris Shaparo and the Wilbargers and all of those amazing people, we look at it in terms of three levels. Um, and the, the optimum level of arousal is the level that we are doing the most learning in. High level of arousal is, um, which we'll go through in detail each one. So there's optimum, there's high, and there's low. So we first look at the optimum level of arousal. That's the arousal level that we actually aim to have children in when they're in a learning, a true quiet learning environment. That's when, or at a birthday party, or at the shopping centre. Because at this stage, we're really able, this is where we focus and explore tasks, activities and environments. We can concentrate, we can joint share our attention, we can make appropriate and meaningful interactions, we have good eye contact, uh, we can adapt to stressful situations. So if someone in the playground throws a, a, a a bucket of sand on my head that I'm going to get a bit upset but after five minutes I'll go off and play again and it's the time when there's self-control. So that's the optimum level of arousal. And typically this might be the, the, the typical adaptive response in an optimum arousal. We'll wake up in the morning and as we go through, so the blue is the low level, the green is the optimum and the red is the high level of arousal. So we wake up in the morning, we might feel a bit low, but pretty much we can go straight into optimum level. We might go outside in the playground at lunch and have a great play and we're coming into um, at, you know high level of arousal, but then we come back inside um, for uh, a little bit of quiet play with mum or, or it might be uh, nap time at kindy or um, you know, quiet play time in the childcare, and it might even dip down a little bit into the lower arousal again because it might be nap time. And then we go up again ready for more play until by the time we get to bed, and hopefully for a little toddler it's not 8.30, but then by the time we get to bed we're quite down into the lower arousal again. So that's what we would typically see. And you can see there as well, which is important to point out, that the optimum band is quite a wide band. It is, we vary up, up and around there, we might cross over a little bit, but the band is very, is very wide. With the high level of arousal, what we see is the kids that can't sit still. We might classify them as hyper, or might hear other people classify them as hyper. They're quite distractible, so they, they, they can't focus their attention on mum or on dad or the teachers, the daycare staff very distractible. They tend to talk fast, loud and a lot. So they're constantly asking questions and very fast and sometimes even a little bit too fast. They're, they're stumbling over their words and 
that can't calm themselves down for rest time or at desk time. So those are the ones that come in from an outside play, um, say for example at childcare, and they come in and it's time to, to lay down on the mats and they're still wriggling and moving and pulling at the table and rolling themselves up into the, in their little mat instead of lying down nicely. They can be very intense and quite highly sensitive, so they blow up very, very easily. They don't like stress, they don't like transitions, and they don't like changes in routine, and sometimes a little bit on the aggressive side. Not necessarily intentional, uh, but can be come across as quite aggressive. So in terms of the chart, what we're seeing here is that they wake up in the morning and they're straight away right up into that high level of activity um, and to the point where they, they rarely come down through into the, into the optimum level. And so although we can see that they might be starting to learn some concepts, so for example they might be starting to learn um, uh, vocabulary as, as a young toddler, they might be starting to learn colours and shapes as they get older, they might be learning about puzzles and shapes, they just don't spend a lot of time. So ideally what we should be seeing is that nice wide green band that you can see on the slide. But mostly that band of optimum level is so narrow that they just can't seem to spend a lot of time in there. And then they, they come straight down and hopefully they'll crash by around 8.30, but oftentimes we get feedback from parents that they are up until 9.30, 10 o'clock still coming in and out of their bedrooms or you know rocking around in their bedrooms. So. So on the flip side of the high level of arousal, we have the low level of arousal, and those are kids that are very hard to get going, very lethargic. They actually feel, they look a little bit uninterested and lack of motivation, so they don't really want to do anything. Um, they don't tend to enjoy physical activity as much, and even if they do, they get tired very quickly, so they lack the endurance. Not a lot of facial expression on these kids, they're quite flat in their affect um, and of course that then affects their social skills um, as well because they just can't read anything and no one can read them. They're the ones that tend to collapse on the desk or they loll around on the floor, not the active rolling and the seeking that, that the um, child on a higher arousal level does, but literally just, they just loll around on the ground, they're, they're just there very slow to move as well. So a lot of these children, um, you know, really appear to, to, to be very flat a lot of the time and can be quite, quite whiny, quite whingy and very emotionally um, labile. So in terms of their chart, they really barely get up into the optimum level. So they're the ones that the parents say it takes them, you know, so long to eat breakfast in the morning and I can barely get them changed ready to take them to, to play group or to childcare. And they love to sit and watch TV or um, I have to really drag them to the playground. So they're the ones that we find their level of optimum, optimum level of arousal is, is very narrow as well and they barely get up into there. Now, probably what we need to say right here is that there is oftentimes children that show a completely mixed response. So they don't fit into just being high level, they don't fit into just being low level, they literally just go through um, different levels of arousal throughout the day. And that makes our, our jobs to help families kind of work through that a lot more complex because they're, they're not straightforward. These kids really, you know, we really have to help families be able to be the sensory detectives because we need to be able to give them the whole toolkit, as Diane Henry in the States would say, the whole toolkit of what do you do when you see your child in low level? What do you see, do if you can see your child in low level? To really bring them either power up which is another term that um, the Schellenbergers use, um, or Schellenberger and um, uh, Williams in the ALERT program. Do we need to power them up from the low level arousal, or do we need to power them down from the, the high level to get to where we want them to be for a, a learning task? Now, a learning task might be a birthday party, 
going to the shops, um, going to the playground. Those are all considered learning for these little kids. It's not just sitting in a desk to do flashcards and drawing. So the mixed ones are the ones that we probably see the most. So this one um, is from the Wilbargers, from Patricia Wilbarger and their sensory defensiveness workshop. Um, and so really we can see again what the, the low level, the optimum range and the high level does. The other thing to probably bring up here is that it can be really quite confusing in terms of um, when they're in sensory overload. We might see a picture of um, low arousal, but they might have reached to, to such a point of high arousal that they've reached shutdown and therefore present as low because they're just suddenly withdrawn and not responding to any information. And it's our job to either to be able to detect that and then help families to detect that so we don't keep stimulating them to come out of the low, what we perceive as the low level. So I hope that's un I hope you understand where I'm going with that. We really do have to picture what led them to that point of withdrawal. Did they just not come out of a lower level of arousal so they are uninterested and, and avoiding? Or have they reached shutdown where we actually have to give them some calming type of influence to actually bring them out of shutdown? Very tricky. Um, what Chris Shaparo says, and I think Stuart Shankar actually does very similar, and um, is really that it's the rate of recovery that we have to concern ourselves with. Um, really, we are all variable in how we modulate our input, and it's not the variability that concerns us, but it's how we can actually recover. And a lot of the children that we see don't recover well, um, and that's when we see the dysfunction. So we really have to talk to our families about, well, you know, they come in from the playground, they might be a bit active, but can they then recover to, to do the task? And if they can, then that's not dysfunction, but if they can't, then that becomes the problem. So Stuart Shankar, who um, you know, I was lucky enough to, to see one of his public lectures, unfortunately not lucky enough to do one of um, his, his more advanced practitioner courses, but he talks about self-regulation and it's really the ability which is um, the ability to manage our own arousal states, behaviours and attention so that we can be socially acceptable, we can achieve our goals, we can maintain our relationships and we can keep learning and be um, healthy and well. And it's the ability to be able to burn but then recover energy. And what we also see a lot of the time is um, that we need this, that the, the difference between self-regulation where you can you know, really deal with stresses and really manage those stressors rather than inhibit the impulses. So a lot of the time we hear families say, but they're angels at school and then they come to me and the whole, they just fall apart and we have, you know, arguments and fights from the minute they get home at three o'clock to when they go to bed. And what we can maybe make a judgment about is that they're actually in inhibiting their sensory impulses at school rather than actually regulating their arousal levels at school or at childcare. So that, and that's quite different because that's what we need to help them be able to do is have a toolkit so they can manage those stresses of childcare, of playgroups, of school, manage those stresses that come up rather than just inhibit them and then they've depleted all their energy by the time they get home. Stuart Shankar talks about um, activity, participating in activities um, demand energy and fuel and different activities use different amounts of fuel. Some children use more fuel than others. But what happens is that when a child has less ability to control that fuel reserve and then the fuel reserves are depleted, they then don't have enough to meet the subsequent challenges and stresses. And that's where the inhibition of stresses or inhibition of impulses versus proper self-regulation comes into play. And we see that a lot of our children just don't self-regulate, they just can't self-regulate. They don't have a good toolkit, they don't have good body awareness about themselves, they can't filter information, they can't plan what is needed to be done, so therefore they're not self-regulating, they're just inhibiting. Stuart talks about four key principles. One is to be a good detective, which we've spoken a little bit about. What are the child stresses? What helps them stay alert, calm and organised? 
exercise, which is really using proprioceptive and vestibular input, activities that work the deep muscles, lots of resistive work. Mindfulness programs such as yoga, meditation and relaxation, and it's never, never too early to start breathing techniques, start quiet time with music, um, and then play. So those four are the key principles that he talks about. What's really important, and I'd like you to keep reflecting on the clients that you're seeing and how you might fit some of what you're, we've talked about today, how you might fit that into play, but also re re reflect on what is your own level of arousal and how do you regulate your level of arousal? What are your um, triggers? What are your stresses? What is your toolkit? Because if we have to have a good um, ability to recognise our own self-regulation and our own arousal needs so that we can work with the children that we see. And on the same token, we have to actually help families recognise what their um, needs and arousal levels and sensory systems are doing so that they then can also work with their children. Because isn't it right that so often we see a family come in and the, the little one is just Binging like a ping pong ball from activity to activity, really high level of arousal. And mum is the same. But we're trying to tell mum to include activities that bring them down and to use her voice and to use her body and to use her, her, um, the lighting in the house as a way to help calm a system down. If we're asking her to do that, but then that doesn't help her system, then it might be a mismatch. So we really have to work very closely with our families on matching the family's um, sensory system needs and preferences with the child's sensory system needs and preferences. This is the latest Winnie Dunn model. Um, and so this has just come out in her, late, her newest sensory profile. So um, we just had a, a, I did an online um, webinar on the introduction of the new sensory profile, sensory profile 2. So this is the way that she's included it. Very briefly, I'll go through what her quadrants are. We don't have a lot of time, but again, that's another amazing way to look at sensory processing. So we done um, divide it into four quadrants. Sensory seeking in other kids that are have a high threshold, um, so it takes a lot of information to reach that threshold, and but they actively try and self-regulate. So they're really full of ideas, full of responses. They notice and enjoy everything, and they're fidgety, excitable, and continuously engaging. It's when we see um, the kids that just can't regulate through their seeking um, systems that it becomes a problem. So the ones that are still seeking that information inappropriately at nap time, are still seeking that information inappropriately at dinner time or meal time. Registration is, um, is the children that have uh, a very high, so we mainly say low registration, very high threshold. So again, lots of information that need to be come into the body to be able to reach that threshold and for the body to register it. But these are kids that don't necessarily do anything about it as compared to the seekers. So they're really able to focus but they're not really affected by anything. They're, some, they're, they're uninterested and apathetic, quite self-absorbed about things. So they just literally, they just sit there most of the time and let the world go by. They don't really actively try and self-regulate. The sensitive kids have a very, very low threshold. So not low registration, I should have changed it. It's a very low threshold. So that's, those are the ones that as soon as something comes into their body, they might feel it straight away, and they might hear it straight away, they might um, you know, uh, taste it straight away. Everything is so intense to them immediately. Their threshold is very, very low. Um, but they don't do anything to change that. They're very vigilant, very... Um, you know, observant about everything because everything just comes in straight away. Very particular about completing tasks on time and about rules and boundaries and they tend to complain a lot but don't necessarily change the situation for themselves. Unlike the avoiders who are, again, very low threshold but they're actively trying to self-regulate. So they put in place very clear structures, very clear boundaries, because that's what they love. Um, they like routines. 
uh, they were nearly reliant too much on those routines because as soon as something changes, they will literally um, be defensive to it, show uh, negative behaviour. They will actually act out to actively bring themselves out of that situation. So if we have a quick scan ahead, in, you know, look ahead in terms of, you know, that the person who's an avoider will actively say, I'm not going down to that busy marketplace, I'm going to stay right up there in my bedroom with the window closed and just um, curtains probably closed as well, and I'm just going to stay up here until it quiets down. The seeker is the one that goes through with the bright as clothes, um, as fast as he can, and may even bump into a few people on purpose because that's what he likes to get is that information and really just takes it all in. The sensor is the one that um, really registers everything, takes it all in and, um, and actively will try and, and um, do something about it. And the bystander is the I'm just going back. The bystander is the one that registers it, but doesn't really care too much. You know, quite happy to just let the world go by around them. Um, doesn't really have to do anything about it. Doesn't really want to do anything about it. Just lets it go. So, putting it all of this into clinical practice for, ther for us as therapists, what do we use? We use sensory histories and sensory questionnaires, both non-standardised and standardised. So there's a sensory profile, there's a sensory processing measure, um, uh, there's just sensory questionnaires that you can find on, online and a few others that have been written as well. Um, and we need those from families, from childcare staff, from teachers, nan and poppy, um, grandparents are very important as well because we, they often see different sides of children. Um, so we do need a really in-depth sensory questionnaire in terms of what are they showing now, but what did they show prior as well, previously, that they might not be showing, but that still could be impacting on the way they're processing information. We need to watch them, um, ideally at home, school, the community and the centre, because all of those are different environments. Obviously that doesn't always come into play. Sometimes we use formal assessments, but most of the time with those kids that are truly in terms of sensory processing, it's the basis, then we may not use any formal assessments. Really important that it's consultative. It's the key to our work. Once a week with a therapist is not going to do anything. It's what happens on a minute-to-minute, -minute, hour by hour, day-to-day -day situation in all of their environments. So we talk to parents, we talk to other carers, and we talk to teachers. And we do really uh, sessions in, in clinics as well um, in order to really teach families their toolkit, teach kids their toolkit, um, get to give them some new motor plans, new visual plans, new um, auditory plans. And then also we, we, we really, it's, it's both. Without both, it doesn't work. In terms of the direct approach, if we go there, we um, tend to use, or at least myself, you know, as OTs, we tend to use both the bottom-up approach, which is really um, addressing the sensory regulation, sensory modulation needs um, through therapeutic listening, ther sensory diets, therapeutic brushing protocol, um, sensory motor programs, lots of different therapy based on the philosophies of sensory processing and sensory integration, as well as the cognitive top-down approach. So using um, programs like How Does Your Engine Run, um, Focus on Information Processing, PRPP, Cognitive Behavioural Strategies, and then also um, direct instruction. So really teaching them how a letter is formed, really teaching them how do you climb up a ladder and over the top of an A-frame. Those kinds of things are really important. So we're really going, doing a both approach. Without both approach, we're not going to be able to attack the two streams um, the, I guess the whole child and the whole family. So our role as OT is really to figure out what about, um, what is the child's sensory base needs? What are the triggers in the environment? What help makes them feel good? What doesn't make them feel good? Um, what situation do they need um, powering up? What situation do they need powering down? And really our role is to empower the families and carers to be sensory investigators and sensory detectives. So we use sensory diets, we use sensory activities that are integrated into the daily routine. 
and we really work on helping your child to increase self-awareness and adaptive responses to their input, really allowing them to start recognising from a very young age that their engine is running really fast, why don't we try this so that we can start, we can sit down to read a book together. So we're really starting to look at self-awareness with these children. So sensory diets are really, a, you know, we all have them. We all have a sensory diet. I, for example, get up in the morning and I really need a cup of coffee first or my preference is to have a cup of coffee first or um, please don't put that loud music on first in the morning because that's just going to bombard my system. So we all have it. But sometimes what we need to look at with the children is that their strategies that they're choosing are not necessarily appropriate or adequate. So if the thing that they love to do first thing in the morning is to run around screaming through the house, that might not be appropriate, but can they go outside onto the trampoline? Can they get a really big doona squish in on the bed in order to get what they need? So what we need to do is talk through with the families what we can do as for a sensory diet, which is specific sensory input at regular times that matches the family. And it's collaborative. We talk to the family, what do you do when? And we do it specifically. A sensory diet should really be implemented every one and a half to two hours um, per, uh, during the day. And that's really so that it, our levels of that input are maintained in the system until the next bout. If you do it less, that's no problem, as long as we are recognising and investigating and being a detective about what helps the child get to the optimum zone. We consider educational activities, play activities and leisure activities. The most intense are the vestibular and proprioceptive inputs. So those are the ones that have proven to be the most influential and I, I know that definitely is when I do my sensory diet, the, the vestibular and the proprioceptive input is probably the, the one that I include the most. The proprioceptive input is grounding and the vestibular and proprioceptive input both have a direct impact on neurochemistry as we talked about before. And we also said that every two hours is what is ideal. So I won't go through this, but this is just an example of how we here at WISE use sensory diet. And this has actually come from um, the wheelbarrows. And also oh, a few years ago, I'm sorry, I can't remember their names, but I did a, um, a sensory uh, processing workshop with a, a two New Zealand OTs and they talk a lot about sensory diets as well. So in a sense it's quite prescriptive when you're, you're telling the parents the times, you're literally going through their daily routine and finding out when can you put into place some activities that matches the environment they're in. So that one's the kindy one. When we consider a sensory diet, we have to consider the three main things of the type of input that we're using, the frequency of input that we're using, um, actually there's four, the intensity of input and the duration of that input, so there's four. And we consider what kind are we going to use. We don't just stop at vestibular and proprioceptive. We can use input from all senses. The oral motor um, input is the most intense, then it comes movement. Um, then there's visual and then there's auditory. So, um, so that's what um, we really we really do want to, to take into consideration. But it's a matter of sometimes just play around with it and be honest with the families and say we're just going to try this. And it's really important to just, um, if you can, as much as possible. And it's a little bit more possible now with Skype sessions and um, oh, what's on the 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 iPads you can do face to face and FaceTime to actually even if they're more rural to be able to have a FaceTime and a direct um, you know conversation about two weeks after you've given them a sensory diet how's it going what's working what's not working it's not setting concrete let's have another chat let's keep talking about it and see what else could work really important to consider our impact our makeup how we talk how close we are what we what we're putting on our bodies to smell nice, what clothes we're using, the colour, the texture, um, and what tone of voice we're using. Sorry, I'm starting to rush now because I'm aware of the time, so hopefully I'm not going too quickly. In addition to ourselves, what about the environment? You know, a lot of times you walk into families' homes and, um, you know, they, they have the playroom, which is fantastic, and it's chock-a-block, 
so many toys everywhere. Is there a way we can talk about, um, you know, putting things in boxes for the child that needs more visual structure? Um, is there a way that we can actually remove things so that there's not too much visual distraction around? Um, can they have darker curtains if they prefer light or more light if they need more light? Can there be a CD player playing in the background? All of those things. And the same goes to classrooms when, you know, as we know we go into classroom, there's things hanging everywhere. So being able to recognise how we can actually change an environment within the realms of that of environment to, to enhance a child's functioning. I, I put this together um, for a school here in WA that, that I did some uh, work with, a, a, a special needs school. Like, um, and really, we talked about what what system and what how will you what how will you use the information to arouse for that system and calm for that system. So that was just for your information. Right. So family centre practice and how does it all fit in? So family centre practice really is um, the way that we begin with a child's and family strengths, their needs and hopes and we work that into a service plan which is responsive to the needs of the whole family. It involves education, support, direct services and self-help approaches. And really our role as a service provider is to support, encourage and enhance the competence and empowerments of the families in their role. And family centre practice works on a continuum. So if we have a family that walks in and says, I just need you to tell me what to do, then we're actually on the continuum of more professional centred, but it's still within the realms of family centred because it's what the family is, is telling us that they need. Now, our role as therapists is to help start to empower them, but if that's where we need to start, then that's where we start and then we move through. If we're already at family focused and family centred and they're really taking it all on board, but suddenly their child gets sick and they go into hospital, we may even have to go back to being professional centred again. But again, it's all on that continuum. It's not prescriptive and it's not set in stone. It moves. It's very dynamic. The key elements of family centred practice is the family involvement, information provision, it's individual, flexible and responsive. We recognise that all families are unique and different. Um, we actually hopefully um, provide families with the opportunity to access a range of supports and resources. We build and acknowledge on family strengths and we consider the whole family. And that's not just the parents, that's the siblings, the cousins, the grandparents, the uncles and aunts, the families that are um, considered to be extensive, uh, family extended. And we give them an empowerment to actually be able to, to help themselves. What I'd like to do is, um, as a way to kind of try and bring in the, the, the sensory processing side that we've breezed very, very quickly through, and the family-centered side, is some, uh, two, two case studies. And these are actually uh, two little kiddos that um, one of our OTs uh, see, has put together here. So the first one is Bronwyn. And Bronwyn is a two-year-old girl who has a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and epilepsy. She has very limited eye contact, little social interaction, avoids being touched by people other than the family, shows a delayed fine motor and gross motor skills, is non-verbal, and generally shows low registration. So what we do first with all our families when we um, work with them is we really talk to them about what their goals are. So, And that's where I talked about the, um, the questionnaires that we use aren't necessarily always formal assessments. They're really unstructured assessments. We really need to get to a, a really clear idea of what are the goals that the family wants to work on. And this family's goals were to improve communication skills, to improve social interaction, and to improve gross motor skills. Now looking at those goals, we could actually say, well, the OT doesn't need to be involved. But through close collaboration and close communication with the family and with the team, we really were able to talk to the family about um, how OT may be able to support the growth development in those goals. And so although the primary goals weren't OT specific, um, part of the, the information gathering from the family was to get some information through the sensory profile. And she looked at, you know, primarily being low registration. 
Uh, so the implications of her, the, the results on the profile and on how this might impact on her daily function were discussed with the family and therefore some activities and some interventions put into place. But the interventions focus primarily on improving vestibular and proprioceptive input and challenging her muscle and movement sets. So again, remember, we are dealing with a child who has a neurological disorder, so sensory processing or um, impact sensory processing works in a very different way, but it doesn't mean that we can't use it in, in as an adjunct to what we're doing on a motor um, level as well. So we spoke, the sensory diet was embedded into the daily routine and that included jumping on the trampoline, um, some brushing, not the structured therapeutic brushing protocol, but just with a, um, with a flannel after her bath time, playing with different textured toys, using the scooter board, they purchased some equipment for home, rolling over the ball to do some functional tasks. Um, so puzzles over the ball, so getting some weight there and getting some resistive movements and proprioceptive input. And parents were constantly in the sessions um, here at the clinic and at home and then able to then embed some of those activities into their daily routine. Actually, so here it says that the family didn't like the home visit, they actually wanted the clinic environment. So you can see that although the primary goals established by the family were speech um, uh, weren't OT specific, we were able to, to really talk the family through how can we um, help you on a family-centred level to be able to recognise the importance of the sensory side of things to actually further the development of your social skills, the communication skills and the gross motor skills. So the next one is a little boy called Ricky and he's five-year-old who attends pre-primary full-time. He has a diagnosis of sensory processing disorder and ADHD as well as severe digestive dysfunction. And he presented with severe tactile defensiveness and tactile sensory seizures. use. So he doesn't wear clothes at home or shoes in the classroom. He has all tags removed, all cords and buttons are chewed, and he sh hates self-care tasks. He can't sit on the mat at school. He can't attend to tables for activities. He's very aggressive with other children and basically is showing delays across all of the developmental areas. So the main goals identified from this family were to improve the school participation and for the sessions to be at school because mum was expecting her third child and home was chaotic and she couldn't come here to the centre because of all of the demands. So the OTIS intervention were mainly school set environments with only one or two clinic sessions. Um, and the core focus was on sensory diets in the home and school. The OT, um, so Zara, visited the school to meet with the teacher and discuss the challenges in the school environment and the sensory diets were explained and sensory strategies that the teacher felt she could bring into place at school were actually presented. Um, the therapy at school was working on Ricky's modulation and regulation and attention to, to participate in activities. Um, and it included the um, concepts behind the ALERT program and how does your engine run. Um, we looked at, the OT looked at being able to set up, adapt the environment to include a sensory corner for when Ricky identified the need of feeling overwhelmed and overstimulated. So we're working on the self-regulation strategies and setting the environment up to be able to, for him to access those, his toolkit. Um, therapeutic brushing protocol was used and also visual schedule to help guide his, his planning. So the teacher incorporated all of these sensory activities with the whole classroom, um, such as wall push-ups after lunch, bear walks as part of the obstacle course in the morning, and stretches before writing. So she, this teacher was on board 100%, which was fantastic. And then every school visit um, included uh, feedback to the family so that they could actually put into place some of those activities at home as well. So that that that. Brings us to the end of our um, of our presentation, and I do appreciate your time. Basically, what this, in summary, sensory processing is in everyone. We all display our preferences. We all display differences. There's only dysfunction when we can't participate in what we need to participate in, and when our roles are disrupted. So, if we go back to occupational performance um, roles, if the role of a um, a player a child who wants to play is disrupted, then we need to address it. If the role of a student is disrupted, then we need to address it. Um, and we really, our role is to investigate these differences and what they, what impact they have on their function or on the dysfunction, and then to be able to educate and liaise with everyone and to be able to ensure maximum 
occupational performance. And really, I strongly believe that the intervention for difficulties with sensory processing can definitely be incorporated as part of a family-centred service delivery model. So that, that's it. So basically our role, isn't it, is to promote independence, promote functional skills and problem solve as a team.